Okay. I just need a thumbs up whenever you're ready. Okay. All right. Good morning, everyone. It's so good to see you. And I'd like you to turn with me, please, in your Bibles to the book of Revelation once more. We're in chapter 20. We're considering what's known as the millennial reign of Christ. And I'm going to read uh, from verse 1 uh, down to verse 10. And so it begins this way, and I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads, or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison, and shall go out to deceive the nations, which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together, to battle the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth, and compassed the camp of the saints about, and the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And again, God will bless that reading from his precious word to us this morning. When we began looking last time at the millennial kingdom, uh, we noticed some of the aspects of that thousand year reign. We noticed that it will be a time when Satan will be imprisoned and he will not be able to deceive the nations during that thousand years. Uh, he will be uh, out, of, out of service for a thousand years. Oh, what a bliss, blissful time that will be. And the demons as well will also share in that binding they will not be active either and, and so nobody will be deceived as they are today we read in first timothy about the the lot of times and people will, will sub submit themselves to doctrines of demons there won't be any of that it'll be a time of doctrinal clarity and purity no deception what a wonderful time it will be we also saw that there'll be some amazing changes the geographical changes uh, the botanical changes, the zoological changes, uh, the human body uh, will not be uh, as vulnerable to sickness and disease as it is now. It talks about an infant dying a hundred years old, and uh, uh, you know, kind of, we say that, uh, well, he he died really young. He was a hundred. <laughs> just amazing. Longevity will be restored, just like it was back in some of the patriarchal days. Uh, people will live long lives, and then, of course, Israel will be restored uh, to be the head of the nations rather than the heel of the nations. So we, we considered some of those things last time. I want to consider uh, this time uh, who then will reign with Christ. Because verse 4 says, And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And so we want to consider who the throne sitters will be during the millennial kingdom. And so it's going to be an interesting thing for us to consider. And so we want to begin uh, by looking, first of all, at Matthew's Gospel, chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19, and we will see in Matthew 19 and verse 28. 
the Lord made a promise to his disciples. It says, Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that you which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit on the throne of his glory, you also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. So what we can say is that there's a time coming, and it's another descriptive term of the millennium. He calls it the regeneration. Uh, just as we are now born again, we're regenerated, the whole world is going to experience a rebirth. After all these centuries of the curse, the millennial reign will be like a rebirth. It'll be, it'll be like a new day, a new dawning, a wonderful time uh, will this uh, thousand-year reign be. And during that thousand-year reign, the 12 tribes of Israel will be judged by the 12 apostles. Now, of course, we know that Judas won't be one of the 12 uh, because he went to his own place. And we know that there was a replacement found. Why was it so urgent for Peter to say, we need to find a replacement? Well, he, he thought the Lord was coming back, right? In, in chapter 3 of Acts, it talks about uh, a time of refreshing from the presence of the Lord if Israel would repent. Well, if they had repented, uh, they, there's a vacant throne. We've got to get that filled. And so he picks Matthias. He's chosen to replace. So they're the 12. Interesting, later on in Acts, when, when James was beheaded, there was no talk of replacement. Because the 12, the thrones are all filled now. No need for another one. Right? So, so they're going to be reigning. Uh, look at Daniel chapter 7. Daniel, book of Daniel chapter 7. They're going to be on throne, throne sitters. Uh, the 12 apostles and their particular sphere of judgment uh, is going to be the uh, nation of Israel. They're going to judge the nation of Israel in the millennium. So if uh, Israelites have disputes or difficulties, they will go to the 12 apostles and they will judge the matters that are brought before them. Daniel 7, verse 22, it says, Until the Ancient of Days came... And judgment was given to the saints of the Most High, and the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. So again, judgment given to the saints. And again, I want to suggest to you that in this context here, Daniel 7.22, it's speaking of some of the Old Testament saints, the patriarchs of old. In fact, just to strengthen that argument, I'd like to look at Matthew again. In chapter 8, Matthew chapter 8, Matthew 8 and verse 11. And so it says, and I say unto you that many shall come from the east and west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. So there's the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And people are going to come from all over the world, and they're going to say, can you imagine sitting down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob uh, in this, this new millennial era? And so these Old Testament saints will also have a responsibility of reigning and judging on the earth. But what about the church age saints? Well, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6 now, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, the uh, the bride of Christ, what will our responsibility be? Where will we be in the millennial kingdom? And so he says in verse 1, he says, Dare any of you having a matter against another go to law before the unjust and not before the saints? Do ye not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know ye not that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? So we're going to be involved in an administrative role in the kingdom of the Lord. And we're going to be judging the world. So maybe the Gentile world will be our responsibility to judge. Whereas uh, the, the patriarchs and the 12 apostles, theirs, theirs will be Israel. We'll be judging the world. Can you imagine that? You're actually going to be sitting on a throne in judgment, making decisions about behavior in the kingdom. That's going to be our role 
And that's why we keep saying that right now, we are in training for reigning. We're kind of getting ready for that, for our new role in the kingdom age. And, and to the extent that we are loyal to the Lord Jesus in the day of his rejection will determine the extent of our responsibility in the coming kingdom age. And so if you've been faithful in a little thing, he's going to make you responsible for something much bigger, maybe over five cities, maybe over 10 cities, right? I mean, so all the parables the Lord Jesus taught, they were all about this kind of idea that there's a coming day when we will reign, and it might be over cities. We might have responsibility over several cities in the millennial kingdom. We don't think about that very often, do we? But it's really what the scripture teaches. And so right now is a time of preparation, a time of training for reigning. Just a couple of other scriptures that would say about our role uh, in the church uh, in that coming age. Second Timothy chapter 2. Second Timothy chapter 2. And we look at verse 11 and 12, and the verses that were familiar to us, but uh, it's good to be reminded. It's a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also shall deny us. So I, I just want to throw a thought out here about if we deny him, he'll also deny us. It's not saying that we lose our salvation. Uh, if you remember Peter, what did he do? He denied the Lord three times with oaths and cursings, right? And so the denial here uh, would be in terms of responsibility. We, we won't, there'll be, we'll, be, we'll lose reward, we lose opportunity uh, to, to, to legislate in the kingdom age. Uh, he's going to deny us that privilege, but he's not going to ever deny those that he paid the price of dying for them on Calvary. He's not going to deny them. And so we just need to be aware of what this is talking about. Look at Romans chapter 8. One more scripture uh, concerning our role in the millennial kingdom. Romans chapter 8 and verse 17. It says, And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that's in the day of his rejection, that we may be also glorified together. And so in our glorified condition, one of the things that we're going to see is we're going to be joint heirs with him. Now, what is his inheritance? Ask of me, and I'll give you the heathen for your inheritance, the uttermost parts of the earth for your possession. And we're going to be joint heirs with him, ruling over this planet with him. Staggering to even think about these things. And so this is our role. This is our role in the kingdom age. Who then will reign with him? Of course, he wants also to, back in Revelation 20, and the verse we were looking at, verse 4, he wants also to recognize that uh, those that have been martyred for the Lord Jesus will also have a special place in that kingdom age. And so he says again in verse 4, I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them, and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. And so these martyrs are specifically mentioned here to encourage them that... Uh, not implying that others will be left out, but these that have suffered so terribly under the reign of the Antichrist and even paid the ultimate price. He was saying, I will rule the earth. And he was going to have this kingdom that he was going to say had no end. <laughs> it's going to be very short-lived. But those that suffer at his hands, they are going to live and reign with Christ for a thousand years. They weren't the losers. They were the victors. He's the loser, ultimately. And so there is a word of encouragement for them uh, that have given their lives in faithfulness for the Lord Jesus. They also will live and reign with Christ 
a thousand years. And then it says in verse 5, but the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. So now he's going to be talking a little bit about the resurrections. And we want to observe in Scripture that there are clearly two resurrections. The Lord Jesus taught this. The revelation of John reinforces it. Uh, there's the first resurrection, and then there is this second resurrection, which is a resurrection of judgment. And if you look back to the Gospel of John, John's Gospel, chapter 5, and verse 28 and 29. John 5, verse 28 and 29, we read this. It says, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice. And of course, we, we already saw, if you like, a, a, a dry run of that with Lazarus. Remember, Lazarus, come forth. And everybody has rightly said, it's a good job he said Lazarus, because if he had just said, come forth, all the graves would have emptied. Such is the power, by the way, of the voice of the Son of God that is able to raise the dead. And so he says, Marvel not, first the hour is coming, which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth, they that have done good, unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil to the resurrection of damnation. Now we're going to think about the good that the ones that are part of the first resurrection have done uh, in a little while, and we'll think about the evil that has been done at the for those at the resurrection of judgment. But for now, I just want you to see, the Lord clearly says there's two different resurrections. There's a resurrection uh, of those that are the righteous. Uh, they they uh, will be risen, and uh, this is the first resurrection. And then there will be a resurrection of judgment for those that will be judged. And we, we believe from Scripture that this second group, the resurrection of judgment, will happen at least a thousand years after the first resurrection. Okay? After the thousand years is over, then they will be raised from the dead. And so we'll think a little bit about that shortly. But for now, just to say this, that there are many evangelical Christians who teach that there's just one general resurrection at the end of the age. And they are completely mistaken. There are clearly two resurrections. First resurrection, which we're going to see here. And, and as we think about this first resurrection, he talks about some things about it. In verse 6, he says, Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. They shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. So I want to think about this first resurrection. And we would say that it's um, a granting, let's explain what we mean, of resurrection life in resurrection bodies to all those that have at some point put their trust in the Lord Jesus. Old Testament saints look forward in anticipation, believing the types and the pictures that Christ was coming. New Testament saints look back to Calvary, but they all are going to be saved. Everybody who's going to be part of the resurrection of life on the same basis. Only one way to be saved, that is trusting entirely in the finished work of Jesus Christ on Calvary. Looking in anticipation, Old Testament saints, looking back in remembrance, New Testament saints, but all saved on the same basis. And so this first resurrection, and just to think that we'll be given the resurrection of life and resurrection bodies as well. And we're going to need them to, for our new environment. We're going to need these resurrection bodies to be able to even take it in, the wonders of it all, the glory of God, to be able to, to somehow look and gaze on the Lord of glory without being destroyed. Resurrection bodies are going to be very needful. We're going to need these new bodies. Amazing that we're going to have these bodies. And so what kind of a resurrection is it? Well, it's a resurrection of blessing. Blessed and holy is he, he says. And of course, the blessing, it's, it's that beatitude that we see throughout scriptures. And, and the idea is, of, of the beatitudes is this. Blessed is he uh, to, to be congratulated. 
That's the idea. This guy is so incredibly blessed. Uh, he, he, he should be congratulated. He should, should be just kind of, uh, just recognize what, how blessed he is. Um, and what a wonderful thing, isn't it, that we will one day have new bodies. In these new bodies, we won't have a sin problem anymore. Isn't that exciting? Are you looking forward to that? No longer having to say, Lord, it's me again. <laughs> it's the same sin again. No, no, we won't have to do that anymore. We will have completely sinless condition in our resurrection bodies. That's something to look forward to, isn't it? That's why we say, even so, come Lord Jesus. Uh, it just, it's not just a case of, I don't want to go through the tribulation. I, I'm tired of this internal war within. And I love to, I'm longing to love the Lord with an unsinning heart that has so much appeal. And so, blessed and holy, and isn't that wonderful? Holy, entirely set apart for God. Blessed, to be congratulated, and entirely set apart for God is he that has part in the first resurrection. And so it's a resurrection of blessing. It's a resurrection of power, because as powerful as the second death is, it has no power over those of the first resurrection. And so the, the second death, uh, it's, it's a, this principle that is, is kicking in, that, that people will be entirely separated from God, Right? Death always means separation. Uh, initially, it meant in the garden, it meant separation from communion with God because of sin. And then at death, it means separation of the, 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 the body from the soul and spirit. And then the second death is the idea of separation from God forever in the lake of fire. And those that have part in the first resurrection, that second death has no power over them. That, it, 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 again, is a wonderful blessing. We'll never experience that. And of course, the reason we won't experience it is because of what our Lord Jesus went through in those three hours of darkness for us. The one that knew no sin, made to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him, and enduring God's wrath against sin in his own body on that tree. So it's a resurrection of power over such the second death has no power. Uh, and then it's a resurrection of privilege. They shall be priests unto God, or priests of God, and shall reign with him a thousand years. So in our resurrected state, we will be this kingdom of priests, kings and priests, and reigning with Christ for a thousand years. Now, we want to think a little bit about the first resurrection. Because you don't want to give the impression that it's just one event when all the righteous are caught up at the same time. Because actually there's phases of that first resurrection. And we know that the phases of the first resurrection begins with the Lord Jesus himself. Christ was the first fruits, right? First fruits is a guarantee of a greater harvest. And so we get that, don't we, in 1 Corinthians 15. In verse 23, it says, But every man in his own order, so there's clearly an order concerning this resurrection, Christ the first fruits, afterwards they that are Christ at his coming. So the first fruits was first. Christ is raised. And then we believe that after the resurrection of Christ, the next one is the resurrection and rapture of the saints which will occur before the tribulation period, where John said in Revelation 4, the door opened in heaven, come up here. <laughs> you heard a trumpet, come up here. Well, we're waiting for that trumpet sound. Uh, when the dead in Christ will rise first, and those that are alive and remain will be caught up. Literally, the word harpazo means literally to snatch away from one place to another. And we're just waiting for that moment where we'll be snatched away just like that in a moment. And so that will occur, dead in Christ, raised at the rapture, because those that are alive caught up in, together to meet them in the clouds in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And then after that, you had the two witnesses were raised at the midpoint of the tribulation period. So clearly there's phases to this, right? And, and that was quite amazing because that was captured on camera. <laughs> the whole world will see their resurrection.
Can you imagine that? Imagine, I mean, everybody's looking at the scene of their defeat and, and the beast's triumph. And they're watching it. I mean, you can imagine everybody totally connected to their screens watching this. And as they're looking, these people raise from the dead right in front of their eyes and ascend to the Lord in heaven. And so the two witnesses. And then at the end of the, uh, the seven-year tribulation, we will have the raising of the Old Testament saints as well as those that have been martyred during the tribulation. And we said that this is uh, found in Revelation 11, and uh, we particularly verse 18, uh, I believe it is, it says, And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great, and should destroy them which destroy the earth. And so at the end of the tribulation, when Jesus comes, and again, the context here, verse 15 of chapter 11, the seventh angel sounded, and there was great voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. He shall reign forever and ever. So it's when Christ comes at his second advent to the earth that the Old Testament saints will get their resurrection and their reward. Okay, And so that completes, of course, and, and we said these, actually, literally, these tribulation martyrs are really like Old Testament saints. Because if you remember, Daniel's 70 weeks, which are determined for your people, right? So we've already had 69, and we've got one week left. But it's talking about Daniel's people, Old Testament saints. So really, they'll be Old Testament saints, and they act like Old Testament saints. Imprecatory prayers, all kinds of things like this, more Jewish flavor. And so uh, these will be raised as well uh, with the Old Testament saints. They'll be rewarded, and then they will come and reign with Christ, as we've already seen. Uh, people will come from the east and the west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom. What a day that will be. So those are the ones that are going to be raised with Christ. Now, from verse 7 down to verse 10, we look at the final rebellion against God. And, and I want you just to see there's this, this kind of idea of that till the thousand years are fulfilled that's mentioned three times in this section. And so I want you just to, to kind of observe that before we look into this final rebel, rebellion. So look at verse 3, where it says, and cast him into the bottomless pit, shut him up, set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. And so we have it in verse 3. We have it again in verse 5. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. And then if you look down in verse 7, it says this, and when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. And so the idea is this, that this thousand years must run its course. Satan cannot be released on good behavior a day earlier. He has to serve the thousand year sentence. And so at the end of that, he is released for a little season. So there's going to be a thousand years of perfect government on the earth. And so he's loosed out of his prison. Of course, we, we all ask the question, who then are the rebels who are going to rebel against God? And why did they rebel under perfect conditions? And we say this, that in the millennial kingdom, of course, we're going to have all these people who are resurrected. They're not going to rebel. They're not going to have a sin nature. But there will be people that survive the seven-year tribulation period and will go into the kingdom. Now, everybody that goes into the kingdom in their human bodies will be saved. Nobody will enter into that thousand years who is not a saved person. But they'll be just like we are as saved persons. They're going to have children. They're going to have lots of children because the earth is going to need repopulating. 
they're going to have to replenish the earth again because you've seen how many people have died in the tribulation period. Yeah, like those that are left, it's, got, it's not going to be a big amount. And so there's going to be a, there's going to be a whole planet to re repopulate. And so people will, will marry, they'll have children, and the conditions will be ideal. Lots of food to eat. No infant mortality. Children not going to die in childbirth. And so just a, a, a tremendous time uh, of, uh, of fruitfulness in terms of offspring. But as we know very well, that you can have a mom and dad who are saved, and they can have a child. And that child can grow up under the teaching of the Word of God and still decide it's not for me, and they can rebel. Now the difficulty in the Millennial Kingdom of being a rebel is Christ is reigning with a rod of iron. And any form of outward show of rebellion will be immediately crushed. And so what's going to happen is in those thousand years, there'll be a lot of people, as time goes on, who are not saved, but outwardly conform. Because the alternative is getting crushed. <laughs> so I, I know how to behave, I'm going to conform. Isn't it in, easy to do that? Uh, I can remember uh, with my, my oldest boy, and sometimes, you know, we tell him to sit down, and, and you could tell by the look on his face, he's sitting down, but he's standing up on the inside. You know how I know that? Because I've done the same thing myself. That's how I know that, right? We're, we're, we know what that's like. And so there are going to be a lot of people who are going to conform. But the problem with this outward conformity is Christ has got eyes like a flame of fire. So if I live in Jerusalem, I might just see him, or more frighteningly, he might just see me. And so if I'm one of those people that's a rebel in my heart, I'm going to get as far away from the camp of the saints, from Jerusalem, as I possibly can. And so people will slowly migrate away. That's why he says when Satan comes out, he's going to the four corners of the earth. And we know that there are not four corners on the earth. It's a sphere. We know that. But we also know that the idea is they're going to get as far away from the very direct presence of Christ as they possibly can. And that's why Satan will have no difficulty locating them and uh, getting them on his side. And so they know that open defiance is fruitless. What's interesting about the book of Revelation is that it teaches us that human nature is not altered by either the wrath of God or by the goodness of God. See, remember during the tribulation period, all these things are coming down <laughs> from God, and what are they doing? They're cursing God. The, the wrath of God did not bring repentance. And the goodness of God, a thousand years of absolute perfect conditions, and yet man's heart still stayed rebellious. And so it says in verse 8 that he shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. Now, again, what a, what a description. This rebellion, it's not just a few. It's as the sand of the sea. You're talking multitudes. Multitudes, by the end of the thousand years, in their hearts are in abject rebellion against God, even though outwardly they're conforming because they don't want to face the rod of iron. But multitudes. And again, doesn't it just show that the heart of man is incurably evil? They've learned nothing from past history. In no doubt, history lessons would be real history lessons in school in the millennial kingdom. Right? There'll be no revisionist history in the school system. And so they've heard the real story. They've heard the consequences of sin. They've, they will have gone through the dispensations. I think dispensations will be one of the number one classes in school, high school in the millennium. They learn about man's rebellion and, every, and they'll even be taught about the end of the, what's going to happen at the end of the millennium and they'll still rebel. 
And then we learn in verse 8 that Satan, who's loosed out of his prison, shall go out to deceive the nations. What we learn is a thousand years of incarceration in the Abyss Correctional Institute did not correct him in one bit. He hasn't changed. He comes out and he does what he did before. Remember we, when we read about the, the blessing of him being put in the abyss, and it says in verse 3, he cast him into the bottomless pit, shut him up, set a seal on him, that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years are finished. And now verse 8, he will go out to deceive the nations. So again, same strategy, deception, deceiving the nations after a thousand years. And again, uh, he's going to do that. He's going to have the assistance. I believe that his demonic hordes will be allowed out as well to work with him in this. And they will gather all the dissidents and rebels who refuse to bow to Christ and will move uh, towards the holy city with a view of finally eradicating God and his Christ forever. That's always their objective. That's what their plan is. And so it says, in, again, that they, they go to the four quarters of the earth, these outlying districts where they've, they've gotten away uh, from the presence of the Lord, and they will gather them together to battle the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. So there'll be this last attempt. And he, he describes it as, uh, Gog and Magog. Now, again, the, the big question, some people say, well, Gog and Magog is also mentioned in Ezekiel uh, and chapters 38 and 39. So is this the same battle in Ezekiel 38 and 39? And I do not believe it is. I believe, and we've said this before, that Gog and Magog will most likely happen at the very beginning of the tribulation when there's this peace going on, when they're talking peace and safety, uh, when, when, when uh, Israel is a land of unwalled cities, they've kind of let down their guard because they've got this guarantee of seven years of safety. How do we know that it's not the same battle? Well, the way that the battle ends is different in Ezekiel 39, verse 11 through 16, and the way it ends here in Revelation 20. In Revelation 39, let's just look there, sorry, in Ezekiel 39, let's just look there and see how the battle came to an end against Gog and Magog, the original Gog and Magog battle. Verse 11 of Ezekiel 39, it says, And it shall come to pass in that day that I will give unto Gog a place there of graves in Israel, the valley of the passengers on the east of the sea, and it shall stop the noses of the passengers, and there shall they bury Gog and all his multitude, and they shall call it the valley of Haman Gog. So there's going to be this mass burial of all those that perished in the first battle of Gog and Magog, and, and actually the whole area where they're going to bury, it's going to stink because of all the rotting corpses. Uh, anybody traveling by will get the smell of this uh, tragedy. Verse 12, seven months shall the house of Israel be burying of them that they may cleanse the land. Yea, all the people of the land shall bury uh, them, and it shall be to them a renown uh, the day that I shall be glorified, says the Lord God. And they shall sever out men of continual employment passing through the land to bury with the passengers, those that remain upon the face of the earth, to cleanse it after the end of seven months shall they search. And the passengers that pass through the land, when any seeth a man's bone, then shall he set up a sign by it till the buriers have buried it in the valley of Haman Gog. And so also the name of the city shall be Hamona. They shall, thus shall they cleanse the land. So there's this, this, time frame where there's going to be burying the land, uh, burying the bodies, cleansing the land. Seven months, the house of Israel are going to be involved in that. Now, it's interesting that after this battle, we go straight from this battle to the heaven and the earth passing away in the great, 
they're not seven months. This is instant. We go straight to the judgment at the end of the, the uh, thousand years. Not only that, how they'll be destroyed in Revelation 20, there won't be any need for burial because it says in verse 9, they went upon the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Nothing left to bury. They're literally going to be burned to a crisp with fire. They're just going to be totally engulfed with fire. No need for burial. And so we see, of course, Ezekiel, the battle, it was a massive earthquake and other divine means that were used here. It's fire down from heaven to consume them. And so, why does he use the term Gog and Magog? Well, this battle will cause people to remember the former battle. It will remind people that man hasn't changed, that this same rebellious attitude that was found in the Gog and Magog war is going to be seen again in this second war. And so he says, verse 9, they went up to the breadth of the earth uh, and uh, compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city and fire came down from God out of heaven. The beloved city tells us it, it, it's going to be Jerusalem, the center of God's earthly purposes. And so they're going to come against this, this citadel, this camp, the fortress of the saints. Uh, they're going to think that if we can wipe them out, uh, we finally dealt with this problem of, of God and his interference in our way of life. We're going to finally deal with it. And heaven's response is a judgment which is swift, reminding us of Sodom and Gomorrah, fire and brimstone coming out from heaven to destroy them. And notice verse 10. It says, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. In, in one sense, we shouldn't even call this the final battle, because really there's no battle. The fight is over before it begins. God finally, at this point, deals with the devil and his followers, and he casts them into the place that was originally designed for them. If you look back to Matthew 25, we're very familiar with this. Matthew 25, verse 41, it says, Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. It was never God's intention that man should end up in this place. It was designed for the devil and his angels. But because man has believed the deceit and lies of the devil, sadly, unless he repents and believes the gospel, he will share in the same fate as the one who has deceived them. And so sadly, there will be human beings who will be confined in this place. And of course, we have an example here of the beast and the false prophet and what we learn is that they were cast in uh, to the lake of fire. If you remember, they were cast directly into the lake of fire uh, with, without dying. Just as we saw Enoch and uh, Elijah taken to heaven without dying, uh, the beast and the false prophet were cast alive into the lake of fire. We see that in chapter 19 and verse 20. The beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. So now, 1,000 years have transpired since the moment they were cast alive into the lake of fire. And it's just interesting how uh, the Word of God wants us to know that they're still there. Because it tells us that the devil is cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. And then it says this, where the beast and the false prophet are. They're there still. After a thousand years of conscious torment 
in the lake of fire, they're still there. The presence of the beast and the false prophet in the lake of fire after a thousand years argues against what is becoming a popular doctrine called annihilationism. An eternal punishment, a thousand years, is just the beginning. It never ends. In fact, it's kind of interesting that it says uh, that they shall be uh, and shall be tormented, the beast and false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Now, let me just say this. The Greek language couldn't put it any clearer than this. What it's saying is, Day and night, from the ages to the ages. That's the idea. Forever and ever. It's ages upon ages. This, in other words, this is not going to end. This is forever and ever. So we, we have to believe in eternal punishment. I just heard some good news this week. It was very interesting that uh, I just heard it this morning about uh, someone had uh, been at the National Elders and Workers Conference down there in North Carolina, and there's a brother, uh, Josh George, is, a, is an, a, an Indian brother, very passionate preacher, a young man, just tremendous brother. And anyway, he gave a, a message on the urgency of the gospel. And uh, some of the folks were so pumped up after hearing this message, they couldn't eat. They just went straight to the doors and started knocking on doors in the neighborhood. And the first door they came to was a house right across from the, from the chapel there. And uh, they knock on this door. And uh, a lady comes to the door. She's an ex-Jehovah's Witness. And she said, all the years, and her whole family have, have shunned her because she's left the Je Jehovah's Witnesses. But she says, every, every time, I, I, all the years I went out on the doors, knocking on doors for the Jehovah's Witnesses, she said, never has an evangelical ever knocked on my door. They were the first. And she's been reading the scriptures, and she's looking for a Bible-believing church. So they said, well, just look across the road. See that building right there? <laughs> That's where we're from. And so what a divine appointment. And again, they were just motivated by the, the, the reality of what will become of a lost sinner. Ages upon ages. One commentator says this, this eternal aspect of hell is so terrible that he thought it was another hell in the midst of hell. The idea of the eternal aspect, that there is no ending. No reprieve, no parole, no getting out on good behavior. This is forever. It's, it's uh, for the ages of the ages. Is this really eternal punishment? Yes, it is. The words mean exactly what they appear to mean. There would be no way possible in the Greek language to state more emphatically the everlasting punishment of the lost than here in mentioning both day and night and the expression forever and ever, literally to the ages of the ages. And so, in one sense, it should make us very thankful that you and I are saved people, that Christ has taken the punishment that we deserved. And we should be eternally grateful, but we can't be apathetic. We also need to be burdened about taking this message to a lost world and sharing that this does not have to be their fate. They don't have to be part of this. Now, we'll, we'll continue into verse 11. We've got about seven minutes left, and we'll consider this final section, <clears throat> which really deals with the, the last, the final judgment of sinners. After the thousand years, this is what we're going to say is the, the second resurrection. <clears throat> and so it says, And I saw a great white throne in him that sat on it, and from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. So as we look at this little section, we just want to go through bit by bit, and we want to think, first of all, the place of the judgment. Where is this going to take place? And then we'll think about the person of the judge, and this is not unique to me. I got this from a, a very helpful commentary. The place of judgment, the person of the judge, the people who are judged, and then the final penalty of the judgment. And so 
beginning with the place of the judgment. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's interesting how a lot of people are very taken up with courtroom dramas, especially south of the border. They just love courtroom. I remember when we first moved to the U.S., um, it was it was this O.J. Simpson trial. And I don't, some of you may remember, some of you may not. But it's almost like the whole nation ground to a halt. Is he guilty? Is he not guilty? I mean, there was just absolute fascination. And then I learned, I don't have a TV, but I've stayed in places where they do, and I learned that there's even programs, uh, I think one's called Judge Judy, where people watch court cases, and they seem to, and there's more than one, and they just love this kind of stuff. So there's this fascination with court cases. But this court case that we find here is very unique. Uh, uh, unusual features of this courtroom drama. One is that there's a judge, but there is no jury. Just the judge. There's a prosecutor, but there's no defense attorney. No clever lawyer will be able to get you off on that day. Interesting, isn't it, how Mr. Darby, who was called to the bar as a lawyer, but refused to practice law because his conscience wouldn't allow him getting a guilty person off. And he knew that he was clever enough to do it. Isn't it sad that uh, in many ways our justice system <laughs> is really as good as the judge you have? And sometimes we have judges and we have lawyers that are so clever they can actually get people off who deserve to be punished. There's no prosecutor, no defense attorney, no sen there's a sentence, but there's no appeal. In this case, it's a final judgment. The results are not only conclusive, but they're irrevocable. So where is this place of the judgment? It says it's a great white throne. <clears throat> we live in a world where increasingly there's no black and white. Everything in our culture is gray. It's all gray areas. <laughs> but this throne is white showing absolute righteousness. That, that the judge who sits on this throne is going to administer justice in absolute righteousness. It is interesting that, and of course we see the analogy, don't we, of black and white. We see darkness and light, evil and good. The throne is white, absolute righteousness. When the judgment will be dispensed, it will be judged perfectly and perfectly righteously. And of course, we, we've got this emphasis on white in several of these chapters. We've got the Lord Jesus in Revelation 14, 14, and he's on a white cloud. And then he's going to come out of heaven on a white horse, and he's going to be sitting on a white throne. And so everything about it is talking about his absolute righteousness. He will judge in perfect righteousness. And so the place of the judgment, I want you to notice this great white throne, but I want you to notice too, it, it tells us that, in, in, in verse 11, I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and heaven fled away. And so we want to see this, that the, that's the end of the, the present order. The earth and heaven flee away. The, the old order has come to an end. The, 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 the planet as we know it, uh, Peter talks about it, it's going to be burned up and melt with fervent heat. It's going to be done. And why is that so significant? Well, the significance is this. The world is a place where man has sought since the days of Cain to get away from God and hide and live life outside of God. There's nowhere to run anymore. It's just the sinner and the one seated on the throne. Nowhere to hide. It's just you and him. <laughs> That's the way it is going to be. Uh, very, very clear. This great white throne the earth has fled away. And of course, there's no mistake about who the judge is. Uh, look back again to John 5. We've been looking at there about the two resurrections. But in this very same, very important chapter, we read about who will be the judge seated on this great white throne. John 5, verse 22, it says, For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. So very clearly, 
the one who's going to be dispensing the judgment on the great white throne is none other than the eternal Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Chapter 5, verse 26. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given the Son to have life in himself, and hath given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Now again, I think that's a very significant thing. Because he is the Son of Adam. You see, if it was the Father judging, I'm sure some smart aleck would say, well, it's okay for you, but you don't know what it is to live down here. You don't know what it is to do a day's work. You don't know what it is to grow up in a family where you were rejected. And you know what? They can't say that to the Lord Jesus. He did do a day's work. He did know what it was to grow up in a family where he was rejected. Neither did his brethren believe on him. Uh, you don't know what it is to grow up in a poor neighborhood. Well, actually, I did. Nazareth was a poor neighborhood. You don't know what it is to have people call your names and question your legitimacy, legitimacy of your birth. Oh, well, actually, I do. <laughs> and you see, the Lord Jesus, he is the perfectly right person to judge because he has been here and lived here and experienced life on this earth. And so nobody can say, you have no idea. You say, oh, yeah, I really do. You know what it is to be, to be misjudged? Oh, well, I actually do. You don't know what it is to be, to be beaten. Well, actually, I do. See, he knows. He's perfect. No more perfect judge than the Lord Jesus. But our time is gone, and we'll have to think more about that next time in the will of the Lord. Amen.